Welcome to another episode of the Modern Facilities Management Podcast, brought to you by Flowpath. I'm your host, Griffin Hamilton. This is the show where I interview industry experts who share their stories, strategies, and insights into modern day facilities management. From hospitality to commercial real estate and everything in between, we'll learn what it really takes to succeed as a facilities manager. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Facilities Management Podcast brought to you by Flowpath. Today's guest, I am pleased to have Angela Spangler. Angela, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you, Griffin. Well, thanks for, for coming on. And I know we've got a lot to talk about. We're gonna dive into what you guys are doing at International Well Building Institute and the well uh, program over there. But before we get into the depths of uh, that conversation, I want you to tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and how you got into the industry. Absolutely. So Angela Spangler, I've been with the International Well Building Institute for about four years now. Um, prior to joining the IWBI, I was actually a professional ergonomist. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time working with facilities managers and health and safety professionals. And I worked spanning both the healthcare and the commercial office sector. And one of the things that really kind of piqued my interest with IWBI was that it was bringing together all sorts of different fields, whether that was traditional ergonomics or workplace design or change management or any type of policies that was really aimed at making people healthier. So uh, it's been a wild ride, but it's been really fun and I've been there for about four years now. Very cool. So over the last few years, I'm sure you've seen, uh, I've been through a lot of changes with the organization. And so uh, let's go into that because I know there's been a lot of conversations about what you guys are doing. I know I was uh, connected with you after I read Healthy Buildings and that really piqued my interest in what you guys are doing. Um, so yeah, I, I guess walk through from day one, four years ago up to now on just the changes you've seen, the evolution of the organization and um, we'll go in, in a little bit more depth from there. Totally. Um, so from day one, uh, we were the premier certification system for healthy buildings. We've actually been in the industry since 2014. And our primary product is the well building standard, which offers the well certification program. And that was developed over six years of research with leading scientific organizations, leading medical practitioners, um, building architects, designers, and we essentially brought together all of these leaders and said, you know, given everything that you know about health and the human body, and then given everything that you know about buildings and design and the performance of space, how do we optimize buildings to really support human health and well-being? So when I joined, um, I was spending a lot of my time, you know, really educating people on the value of healthier buildings. Why is it important to have clean air? Why is lighting important to our sleep-wake cycle? You know, how do acoustics impact your ability to focus and actually achieve the task at hand? And it took us about six years to get to our first 600 million square feet of real estate. And over the past two years, we've seen an absolute shift in attitudes and perceptions on the understanding of the importance of healthy buildings. So we're actually in almost 3.5 billion, with a B, uh, with a B, yeah. <laughs> billion. Um, and we've been seeing projects registering at massive scales uh, over the past two years, you know, anywhere from 1 million square feet a day in the early 2020, up to two to five million square feet a day now. And it's been really interesting just to see the shift, right? Like I'm not explaining why air quality is important anymore. Now I'm explaining different policies that can um, support mental health or different programs that can help ensure that buildings are healthy and safe and easy to reoccupy. Um, so it, it has been quite the shift, but it's been um, a rather pleasant silver lining of the past two years just to have that fundamental understanding that healthy buildings are actually important. Yeah, and, and a point I wanted to, to go over was just this shift in uh, the conversations that you're having. So when you first started, what was that like having a conversation and bringing that front of mind of what a healthy building is? Because I, I can imagine it was 
you know, you're kind of getting that side eye look of like, what are you talking about? Versus now, as you mentioned, that just being, you know, kind of part of our world. So uh, what, what did that transition look like from that, those types of conversations? Well, so fortunately, we've always been lucky to be on the shoulders of giants, uh, one may say. The sustainability movement was one that really brought a lot of familiarity to building certification programs. Um, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with LEED. Uh, LEED traditionally focuses on planetary health, well kind of came onto the scene and said, yes, and. Yes, it's important to have buildings that are sustainable, that are going to give back to the planet, but also how can we start to optimize key decisions around design, our policies, our operations to really support human health outcomes. So many times when I was introducing the topic of a healthy building certification, I would always ground it in a traditional sustainability certification. And we'd talk about many of our top clients are actually simultaneously pursuing lead and well, and we develop tools to start to show exactly where the overlaps are between those systems, because we know that the health of our people and the health of our planet are absolutely linked. Yeah, and that's great that you guys are working alongside one another, because I would imagine that would be the first uh, objection that you'd have is like, oh no, we're all set, we're, we're lead certified. But to your point, it is just that next layer and really focusing on a different component of the building and that is the occupants and the health and safety of the people in it. And uh, with that and covering various industries, you're talking about different individuals going from you know, corporate organizations where we're going in as professionals and employees of um, corporations and then going into K-12 schools where you're talking about the youth uh, of America. And so uh, with that, how have you guys transitioned or evolved from the different um, industries that you're working with and types of buildings that you're working with? That's a really great question. You know, when we started, we primarily were focused on corporate offices, but it became really obvious that healthy buildings are important everywhere obviously, um, and also that we need to protect our most vulnerable populations. So our team kind of took this effort to start to develop sector specific expertise. And I'm actually glad that you brought up K through 12 schools because that's been one of my focus areas for the last couple of years. And when you're talking about the importance of air quality in schools, it's to help improve cognitive performance right? Like you want to make sure that there are no distractions from the physical environment that are going to take the student's attention away from the lesson at hand. So we started to really tailor our content and make sure that we could easily justify why healthy buildings were important for all different populations and all different space types. And we've started to see really big adoption, of course, in offices where, where adults spend most of their waking time, but then also in multifamily residential units. So you wanna be safe at your workplace and then you wanna be safe at your home. And then you think about your kid's school and then you think about the gym that you go to or the movie theater that you frequent or the airports that you're flying through. And we've got clients that actually span all different sectors and all different industries, um, even down to the industrial sector, where you think there, there might not be many people who are actually working within that plant. But from an organization perspective, we've really had this mindset shift about protecting everyone who interacts within that space, whether that's your customer, whether that's your employee, whether that's a visitor, all the way up through thinking about policies that might impact the people working at various components of the supply chain. So we're, we're really taking the shift to really focusing on how to create healthy organizations, either at the individual scale, the building scale, or the entire organizational scale, where companies can start to put all different types of buildings through our programs. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And, and a point you just made was the impact the building has on how we operate, how productive we are. And at the end of the day, you know, we, I alluded to the Healthy Buildings book and uh, something they cited is just the investment you're making in your people. And that being one of the largest, if not largest investment of a business. And so making the most of your investment, it really does start with the building. 
And so if I'm a facilities manager listening to this and it's kind of eye opening on the different components you laid out of the noise, the lighting and air quality, what are some actionable steps I could take to get to that step working alongside uh, well? Absolutely. So we actually have all of our products available on our website, wellcertified.com. Um, and I would encourage all facilities professionals who are tuning in today to go on the website and just start to do like a gap analysis of how do you think your building would stack up to these criteria within well. And I would encourage you to look at programs like the well health safety rating, which was developed in light of the pandemic to get people to come back to the office with confidence or come back to the sports and entertainment venues with confidence or really fill in the blank on the building type. But that's really organizing strategies around things like cleaning and sanitization, air and water quality. There's a HR component, so the policies that govern the people within the space, emergency preparedness programs, and then truly how you're communicating these interventions to the building occupiers in the future. But then start to think through one of the key benefits of pursuing a well program is that they're all third party verified. So pursuing well certification, you actually have someone come on site who's testing the air quality and the water quality and the light levels and the acoustics and the temperature, because in order to achieve that certification, you need to hit those specific milestones. And mm -hmm. in the world of facilities, a lot of what you're doing, it's kind of like good design, right? Nobody says thank you for good design, but they're sure going to complain if the door handle goes the wrong way or all of these moments that create pain points for the building users. Mm -hmm. What we've tried to do since the beginning of our journey is really elevate that the significance and the importance of the facilities management professional to say, hey, even these invisible things are pretty important. And we can actually link building performance to improvements in productivity, reduction in turnover, um, you know, attraction strategies. There's been a huge wave over the last year, really, year and a half of this great resignation. So how are you going to attract the top talent to come and work in your building? when they've just left their last job because of X, Y, or Z reasons. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like this holistic approach, right? It's like everything that the building can do, everything that the facilities manager is focused on, and then everything that the organization can do from that policy pr perspective to promote human health outcomes. Yeah, and, and I love how you're framing it in a way that puts the focus on you know, facilities professionals, where you're exactly right where a lot of the times they're not really getting the credit that they deserve. And a lot of these things aren't, they're not visible, right? They're not front of mind, indoor air quality, for example. You know, that's not something you're gonna notice on a day-to-day -day basis, like trash in the hallway, but it has such a huge impact on your organization as a whole, whether it be productivity or the health of the employees there. And so really shedding light onto the impact of facilities managers making these decisions and making these strategic moves uh, is something that you guys are doing a great job of. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'd say um, stay tuned. The International Well Building Institute is about to introduce a new rating, the Well Performance Rating, and that's really going to help to start put data and metrics behind building performance measures to link things immediately back to productivity, retention, health outcomes, and whatnot. Um, so that program is going to be launching in about uh, mid-April. Okay, right around the corner. Yeah, right around the corner. Yeah, that's incredible. So uh, we've touched on a few areas uh, that you guys focus on. What are the spe specific criteria for well building certifications? Totally. So the well building certification is based on this 10 concept framework and it is the most rigorous. It's like the highest pinnacle of success in terms of creating a healthy building. And those 10 features are air quality, water quality, lighting, acoustics, and temperature. Those are the five that are actually performance tested on site. And then there are five other concept areas, uh, movement, nourishment, materials, mind, and community. 
And those features are typically documented with some sort of policy documents, um, professional narratives, photographic evidence that, you know, the, the design of your cafe is laid out to encourage healthier eating habits by placing the healthier options in front of the less healthy options. You can still have both, but help make people make informed decisions about what they're putting into their body. So of those 10 concept areas, there are two different types of what we call features. And you can think of these as evidence-based strategies. There are those that are the required features, which every project must meet in order to get to that certification level, and then those that are optional. And those optional features are peer-reviewed um, and rated based on impact. So they'll have anywhere from one, one to four points. And in order to go from interested to certified, you would go through the process of enrolling in the program, building a customized scorecard that really meets your goals. What is it that you're trying to achieve within this space? Which are the concept areas that are most important? And you kind of take that balanced approach to that healthy building scorecard. You start to implement those policies. You start to implement those design changes. Um, this can be achieved on an existing building just as well as it can on a renovation or a completely new build. And then after you've gone through that on-site testing and submitted all your documentation for compliance with the well features, you can arrive at one of four certification levels, bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. And that certification is good for three years. You renew just like you would renew the, for LEED certification, and you can always hit higher levels of achievement. So it's not as in you go in, you get your certification and, and that's that, right? And that's part of what I love about the program is that it's consistent because we all know that over time items deteriorate and that's something where you have to stay on top of. You have to continuously test, making sure that the investments you've made are still performing in the manner that you expected. And that's something that as you advertise that you're a well certified building me as an employee going to a building and I see that, I want to know that that wasn't from you know 2005 and I hope that it's still that same standard. You guys are doing something unique where you're consistently checking in on that, which is absolutely something that is incredible there. Awesome, yeah, one of the things, one of the pivots we've made as an organization, which really was born out of client demand, was starting to look at this certification process as just making incremental improvements over time. So when we introduced the Well Portfolio Program, we were enabling organizations to enroll their entire legal entity, right? Every single building type that they have. Um, if it's a mixed use portfolio, you know, you could have all sorts of different buildings with all sorts of different occupants, with all sorts of different functions. But on that portfolio journey, you're really looking at how do the features within well start to scale? When we're talking about like a cleaning policy or a cleaning protocol, if you're using the same cleaning vendor and they have the same standards across a majority of the portfolio, that's a feature that you can document once earn across your entire collection of buildings and start to work your way towards a higher portfolio score over time. So we introduced that program back in 2018. We've seen great success with it. Um, whether clients come in through pursuing one of our ratings, which are more limited in scope and kind of quickly responding to a subset of issues, or whether they're coming in from that big portfolio program, the idea is really hitting those continuous moments over time and making the incremental change and then celebrating the accomplishments that they're achieving along the way. Yeah, that, that's great. Is that a newer program? Um, the portfolio program was introduced back in 2018, but the ratings that we're developing, like the health safety rating that came summer of 2020, um, we're about to introduce that well performance rating in a couple of weeks. I would say towards the end of this year, we'll be introducing a health equity rating, which is basically earmarking all of the features within well that have anything to do with justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, universal design, like right back into that facilities warehouse, 
start to get credit for the things that you're already doing. And you can kind of think of these ratings as like badges, right? Like we're trying to gamify healthy buildings. What can we do with nudge psychology to get you to just make the best choice? And then how can we incentivize you to stay down that path and to continue making healthier, bu healthier buildings and healthier choices over time? I, I love that. And it's something that, I mean, you bring up the healthy food options there and just the placement uh, of each different item. And you guys are thinking of absolutely everything uh, going from the actual building again to the people that the occupants in, in the building. And so um, I'm sure there's a whole nother conversation on different areas that, uh, you know, we're not thinking about or discussing that you guys are really putting a lot of thought and energy into making it truly a healthy experience from the moment you step in and even taking that home, right? Uh, yeah. What And just curious, I know I, I didn't um, ask you this before, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, but we've covered a lot of benefits that you get to expect in productivity, the health of uh, the building occupants, but what have been some auxiliary benefits that you've noticed that you were surprised to see the impact? You know, we've actually been in that space of defining the return on investment for healthy buildings since the very beginning. Um, so I don't know if I would say that I'm surprised necessarily to see these impacts, but I'm really glad to see, like we're working with a hundred of the Fortune 500 organizations already. And a lot of these big companies that actually have impact and an ability to make influential change are starting to use their well achievements to do their annual reporting, whether that's ESG reporting or whether that's through their corporate sustainability report. But we've mapped the standard in a variety of different ways, right? So we've mapped all of the features within the well building standard to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that when we're talking with clients and they're saying, you know, from an investor perspective and from a key stakeholder and decision maker perspective, we need to hit these four goals that are worldly and bigger than us. And we can specifically guide them to the features and well that are gonna help them down that path, which is really awesome to see. So we've been seeing a lot of, um, you know, annual ESG reports coming out where they're talking about their well milestones and their well accomplishments and saying, you know, the E's been pretty, tangible, right? Environmental, we know exactly what that is. Governance, pretty tangible, but there's always been a pretty large question mark around how do you actually measure the features around that S component, the social or the human capital management component. And when you're using a third party evidence-based tool that's holding everyone globally. This is a program that's being adopted in 109 countries all around the world right now. You, then you start to level that playing field. And now you're not comparing apples to oranges, but you're saying, oh, well, certification means something. It means something here, as it does in EMEA, as it does in APAC, as it does in Australia. And so you're starting to see a lot of consistency in the reporting and clients just really looking to the data in ways that I don't think they maybe had before. Yeah, that, that, I love hearing that. And having that standard across the board is, uh, you know, I don't want to skim over that. I mean, that is a big deal and a big topic that you guys have uh, taken on. So I uh, absolutely love hearing that. Um, and, and I guess switching gears a little bit here, looking ahead, mm -hmm. what can people expect as we are continuously working on this healthy building initiative. And I hate to say transitioning away from the green movement, uh, because that's something that is, it's always going to be there and it should be at the top of the list of things to be focusing on. But just to your point earlier, the end of healthy buildings and that initiative. And so as it's gaining more and more traction and you guys are getting the word out the importance of healthy buildings, what is, what's next? What's next for the well certification and the different programs you guys have and uh, in your opinion, just the industry in general? Oh man, if I could see the future, uh, that would be so cool. No, I think that, <laughs> I think that there's been like a base level 
understanding and education that really happened globally over the past two years, right? Like we noticed the dramatic environmental impacts as soon as everyone stopped commuting, right? When the world shut down and um, you could see the direct impact that we're having from a sustainability perspective on pollution. I personally moved to the state of Colorado during the pandemic just to have a little bit more outdoor space, a little more sunshine, a little bit more indoor space compared to New York City. Um, and last summer, th with wildfires happening, their air quality in Denver was worse than any other city in the world. And so you typically think of Colorado or Denver as a pretty healthy place. People are active, they're running, they're doing things outside. When big environmental impacts keep you from leaving your house and it's 100 degrees outside and you can't see more than a mile away, it really shows you that it's not a either or conversation anymore. So I'm really excited for the future of the healthy building movements to be fo focusing on dual certifications, focusing on going through and not just designing a space to be lead like, but actually going through and achieving lead certification or going through and achieving well certification because we're constantly evolving the standard over time. Um, it goes through quarterly updates and each and every one of those 10 concept areas is led by an individual in our organization on our standard development team who has an entire advisory board of experts in the industry who are circling back on best practices in research and talking to us about innovative new technology, right? Like the performance rating is actually going to talk about the efficacy of continuous monitoring for air quality is going to improve over time. It hasn't been there necessarily yet, but when you start to see more lower fidelity testing and measuring devices, becoming so prevalent and in the hands of all regular building occupants, it's good to be one step ahead of that and think, okay, well, here's the plan that we have in place. This is why we created a healthy building. Your building might not always be in the green zone, but you have remediation measures in place and you can communicate, this is what we're doing to keep people safe. So I think it's gonna be with knowledge comes power and with data, comes knowledge, right? So I think it's, we're only going to continue to educate ourselves and continue to create healthier environments. And I think it's going to become the norm so much more, like it's going to be demanded more than it ever has. When you look at that growth curve, just in terms of certification rates, like we're in that hockey stick moment where it's just going up and up and up and up and up. And pretty soon it'll be, um, surprising to not have thought about these things. Yeah, and I, I love hearing that. And I'm uh, certainly optimistic in the direction that we're going. And I, I love the line that you just had of uh, knowledge is power and data provides that knowledge. I absolutely love that because it is something that as an industry, we're seeing those trends of collecting that data and actually taking action with that data. And so that is, very encouraging to see and to hear and with what you guys are doing i am extremely bullish on the impact that you guys have and the growth that you guys are going to experience and have already and so uh, very exciting times in the very near future uh, angela how can people find you or reach out to you guys here um, and explore a little bit more in depth on the well certification Absolutely. You can reach out to me anytime. My email is my name, Angela.Spangler at wellcertified.com. Um, or you can reach out via the website, wellcertified.com. We have our standard available with all of the references and citations. We have really helpful guidebooks and program overviews. We have information on how to get started in your well journey, whether you wanna take that next step and pursue the health safety rating on your collection of buildings or whether you wanna dive right into portfolio. Um, but there's a lot of different entry points. So I would encourage anyone who's interested to reach out directly and I'd be happy to put them in touch with the right person, even if it's not myself. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and those that will be in the show notes. So uh, for those of you listening, make sure to check that out. I have some links there available. But uh, Angel, before I let you go, I've got one last question I ask everybody, which is who or what has had the biggest impact on you and your career? That's a good one. Um, honestly, my dad. He, is, he was a professor uh, when I was growing up and he just instilled a passion of learning and you know going through higher education. So he influenced me going and pursuing my master's degree in human environment relations. And he's kind of been that career coach every step of my journey. So as corny as it may sound, thanks dad. <laughs> <laughs> Not corny at all. We, I can't tell you how often, because I never tell people that's going to be the last question. Because I love seeing that reaction of just like, hmm, who do I call out right now? And it's just so funny how frequently we hear just at home, it's, you know, my parents, my mom, my dad. Um, so certainly not corny and everybody needs that mentor and that guidance through life. And so, uh, you're just obviously very fortunate to have had that, uh, from the get go. But, uh, Angela, again, I, I really do appreciate you coming on. This has been an excellent conversation. Love to have you on once again, because I know we could dive into this in uh, a lot more depth, but, um, again, thank you so much and we'll stay in touch. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the modern facilities management podcast. Make sure to subscribe for future episodes and follow us on LinkedIn for more facilities management content.